everyone, my name is Joel Di Javier and I hail from Colby College and today I will be talking to you about how the age of a prairie dog town affects the herpetofauna in the area. Not a fun herpetofauna. <coughs> Here at the Sepieta National Wildlife Refuge, Fish and Wildlife has been doing a series of reintroductions of the Gunnison's prairie dog. Through eradication programs like the fourth but before, plague and habitat fragmentation, the Gunnison's prairie dog has increased in numbers 98 to 99% over its historical range. But why do we care? Lots of animals have shot down in population. Why did Fish and Wildlife focus on the Gunnison's prairie dog <coughs> to reintroduce out of all possible animals? Prairie dogs are ecological engineers, modifying the landscape to such a degree as having profound effects on the different animals and plants around you. There have been studies done on how animals sorry, have affected vegetation and the wild and small mammal communities. In general, the more prairie dogs there were, the more genetic diversity in the area. The mounds and holes prairie dogs made is one of the most important changes made. Here, you can see the changes that a prairie dog town can make in just four years. This is an aerial view of a prairie dog community um, in 2005, and the lighter areas are the prairie dog maps. Now, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but this is in 2009. There's a little bit different color vegetation. But if you go back and forth, you can see that on the that the mounds have, been, have increased in area. Although prairie dogs can make such large changes when given time, no one has studied the long-term effects. My research this summer, under the guidance of Mason Ryan, has focused primarily on breaking that initial ground. On Sevieta's National Wildlife Refuge, I have been investigating how the age of a prairie dog town affects the herpetofauna in the region. Herpetofauna is a catch-all word for like amphibians and reptiles, and it's frequently shortened to herps. And I'll be saying herbs this whole time. So when I say herbs, I mean reptiles and amphibians. It's just really easy to say. Scientists like Anna Davidson have done research on the effect of the presence of the prairie dogs on herbs on the set, but no one has really compared developing prairie dog towns. Using standard, standardized visual encounter surveys along 400 meter transects, I have assessed species diversity of the herbs on three plots. Plot B is a four year release site of prairie dogs. Plot F is a two-year release site, and plot C is used in my control. Each plot was 16 hectares uh, in area, meaning it was 400 meters by 400 meters, about 0.25 by 0.25 miles, if you're not uh, familiar with the meters. And a visual encounter survey is a survey of individuals done by walking on the plot, counting what you see walking down. There are four transects plot five on plot C and E, but they're uh, kind of like the tic-tac-toe board you see here but only three were flagged on plot F. To help standardize the sampling, I had a couple restrictions on when I could do my sampling. Sampling took about took place from 8 a.m. to noon when it, was warm, when it was warm and sunny with low clouds and low winds. This was not only to help standardize my sampling, but also turned out to be the optimal conditions for her viewing. When it was cloudy, or when it was windy, or when it was too cold, or it was rainy, the lizards and the nobody wanted to come out to come see me. So I did sample on those things just to make sure, and there was absolutely nothing on the plot. And so not only did that help make me help standardize my data, but it helped me get data in the first place when I went out to get there. So the takeaway is really that herps are really picky when they come when it comes to their conditions and only come out at certain times. When I was also when I saw a lizard on or a, whatever animal I saw a herp on the plot, what I would do is I would GPS the point, I would take their uh, sex if I could, I would identify down a species, I would also look at habitat, like where it is, if there was vegetation around, how far it was from a prairie dog mound or a cave rat mound. And that was all written down for just about almost all the species, and also ground temperature when we had the opportunity. After sampling for the last 10 weeks, 63 transects were done in total, and 486 individuals were See. At first glance, it seems that the control and the two year are kind of similar in uh, speech and individual scene, um, with the four year plot being the highest. But this does not take into account the fact that I didn't really sample equally on all the plots. It's kind of hard to get to the different plots 
I can't drive, so I had to depend on other people to drive me there. So, in reality, I only did 26 for the control, 21 for, uh, 16 for the two year, and 21 for the four year. So if you divide the number of individuals seen by the number of transects, this is more of a graph that you see. And this is more of what I expected, for the control to be a little lower than the two year and the four year. One of the original goals of the project was to compare species that were, oh, sorry. This is a graph depicting the number of different species you see on the different plots. Looking at just Aspidocillus internatus, which is the little striped whip tail, see the picture, take that picture. Um, you can see that the control plot and the two year are really close in number, while the um, four year plot are, is a lot lower. For the New Mexican whip tail, it seems to follow that same pattern, with the control and two year being the highest, and the four year traveling a little lower. When it changes is when it gets to Home Maculata, Holbrookia Maculata, which is a lesser Gillis lizard, kind of bad question. And that's when the plot, the four year release site was higher um, when it came to number than the other two um, release site control. This is really just the number of species I can identify. Whiptails, which is the genus Spinosaurus, are really hard to identify at first. And so at first, when I was first doing my uh, identifications, I would see a whip tail and I was like, whoa, it's going really fast. I don't know what it is. So there's a couple that I didn't get identified, but the numbers are kind of even, so it doesn't really affect too much the other whip tails, um, like the number, like the trends. Um, Exanguis was seen also evenly mostly on the plots. It was also kind of hard to see, identify some, like the, some of them get to be like really diff difficult when they're juveniles. Some other whip tails have spots when they're juveniles and the other ones don't. But these are the ones that are correctly identified, hopefully. And if you see on these last three, you can see that only the four year release site had any on these last three um, different uh, species, such as the many lined skink, which is like, I was really excited to be able to see because the last researcher who was here did, this pro did a project similar to mine, not with time but just in general with prairie dogs and lizards. And she only saw skink once, apparently. And I got to see mine in 10 weeks, and she did hers over two years. So I was like really lucky that I got to see it. But only Plot D, the four-year release site, had any of these more rare cryptic species, which I thought was really interesting. And you can kind of see how Plot D has more of an even, even spread of, uh, in comparison to the control of the two year. And when I assess diversity, which was one of the original goals, of my ex uh, experiment, I used the Shannon Liner Index, um, and I was able to calculate this diversity. And on the four year release site, you see that it's the most diverse and rich, while the other two plots trailing behind. Now, I originally thought that the two year and the control were going to be, you know, a little more separate, and I was really hoping that it was going to be like really easy, like control is the lowest, and then two years in the middle, and then the four years the highest, because that would be really nice. But that's not how nature works. Um, so that was really interesting to see. And I was thinking, I was like, maybe if there was like, at the six year and at the eight year, there would be like maybe a trend where it like increases and then like flattens out, which I've seen that trend in other ecology papers. So it looked kind of like this. Please keep in mind the orange and the green are just completely made up and it's like completely <laughs> conjecture. <laughs> but it would be really interesting to see that maybe if this would be the trend in the next two years and then the two years after that and see if the diversity of the different plots does increase, or maybe it's a parabola, or maybe it's like other things, but this would be really interesting. We need more data, obviously. It's only the four year release site that I've been able to study, which is the oldest. But something else that we should have focused on, which I found really interesting, is going back to the Eoplasterulus lizard here, pictures. And I realized that on the four year site, you saw the most, like I saw on the last one, this is more clear. Um, you saw the most um, Pope Brookia on, on the four year release site. And when they were found on the plots, they also tended to be, um, they also tended to be on the mounds. Uh, you can see that the four year is a lot more than the two year, and the control has none that were found on the mounds, on the prairie dog mounds, because there are no prairie dogs on the control site. Which is good because if I had found prairie dog mounds, then that would really bother my dad a lot. <laughs> they had traveled over, but they didn't, so I'm glad. And you can tell that when they are on the prairie, when they are on the prairie dog mounds, we measure distance 
like roughly, and they were 90% of the time on the prairie dog mounds. Now this suggests really heavy use by the lesser earless lizard of the prairie dog mounds, perhaps for solace from the sun because it gets really hot and it can only stand so much um, temperature raising and the ground temperature we saw all the way up to like 130 when it was only about like 90 something outside. So it gets really hot down on the ground. And so the prairie dog mats provide comfort from the sun, from predators, also a lot of flies. I observed lots of flies and different insects flying, also probably to get away from the heat, um, in the prairie dog mounts in the whole so and that's like really what the, a lot of the lizards eat. And so that also is something that is really positive from being in the prairie dog mounts. And I thought that was really interesting that I always found them. Like, you could always just go to Prairie Dog Mount and you're like, ah, there's going to be something here. I haven't seen something this whole time, but there's definitely going to be something here. Because the less fearless lizards are always there. And so that it makes sense that on the four year side, we saw the most less fearless lizards. Because, like, clearly they really like the Prairie Dog Mounts. And the four year side would, would, it would make sense, it would be logical that they would have the most mounts in comparison to the two year and the control. Now you might be wondering, if you can't see snakes, sorry Shane, I'll tell you when the snakes come up. But, um, why didn't, am I talking about amphibians, or snake, uh, or like reptiles, or other snakes, snakes coming up, Shane? It's like really small, but it's right there. <laughs> and, I didn't see them, and I was really kind of upset about that. But, if I, when I thought about it, I realized that the times that I went out really are not optimal for amphibian viewing. And, or snake viewing. I went out during from like when this about half an hour after the sun touched the land. That's when I started doing my sampling, all the way up to around noon. Snakes like twilight hours. They like dusk and dawn. And I wasn't there during those times. Amphibians and box turtles tend to come out right after monsoon rains or any type of rain, really. And we were really not allowed to go out on the refuge most of the time. There was a lot of rain. The, there would be like lots of um the the roads would be had like um, damaged or they don't want us to damage the roads or I couldn't get a ride, um, affected that. Um, so the only time I ever really saw a snake was the other day, it was like two days ago, and I saw this, this snake on Amherst's lawn, and I was really excited to make Cassie take a picture so I could put it here, because this is really, the, I saw three snakes my whole time. The first day when I was here, one time when we were driving, and then this one. And there were, none of them were on my plot. Um, we saw lots of like, and they obviously exist on the set. We've seen them here many times. I just didn't happen to see them when I was out. But I did get to see other things, such as jackrabbits. They came up to me several times to try to eat my cereal. Um, <laughs> DS, which is a pronghorn. Um, another pronghorn. Um, he's famous. He really likes to sit down. He was really close to me, about like five, seven feet. So he was just sitting there eating some grass. He really didn't care about me. And I also saw some tarantulas. Amongst other things, I went out and helped swamp animal people, all that other stuff. So I saw lots of things, just not very many of what I actually wanted to study. So what next? I would suggest that if someone were to pick up this project, they would go out around the same time of day. Um, it seemed that there were lots and lots of lizards. That was like exceptional lizard viewing. There were days where I got 27 on one 400 meter transect, 27 lizards I saw. And that is a lot. Um, that is like obviously the best time. In the literature back set up, people who have done lizard food before really like this time. Sunny days, when it gets really hot, sunny days with um, with, lot, with low co cloud coverage and low winds, like the exact same temper, like the times I went. I would suggest equal transects. Since I didn't get to sample all my plots the same, obviously there's probably some type of skewing going on there. I can't really look at my raw data, I have to take the average, which is not as powerful for certain tests. Also, I only had three transects on plot F. For whatever reason, we just didn't get to do the fourth one. And that would also probably help with the whole going on with the standardizing of my data. Also, more researchers. When I was out on the plots, I couldn't really go out and do multiple plots each day, only because when I started, it would be like just by myself, and it takes about like, 20 to 30 minutes for each transect, there's four per plot, and then like getting that all time, like all that walking in between, um, and also trying to do all the plots at the same time is just really difficult with the time constraints. Sometimes it just got too hot too fast, and I could only do so many transects. Probably somebody could drive, who could like take them out, like go when that is necessary because I need to depend on other people, which was fine, but it would be nice to be able to drive myself out um, and not have to 
bother the people who would be like, hey, when are you going to like this specific part on the set? Because I need to go, please. Um, so more researchers, at least two, to get things done quicker, more effectively, and be able to have more days where you sample multiple plots at the same time. And there were days when I only slipped one plot, and that might be a variable that might um, ruin my data. More consistent recordings. I didn't always take ground temperature, didn't always have the little meter to measure the ground temperature, or like we didn't always standardize the data in the beginning because we were really confused. So that would also help in getting more things to compare. Cover boards, which are these like plywood things that you put on the ground to help get those snakes and amphibians. They like the cold under and the shade. So that would really help getting those more like cryptic, mysterious species to come out and be able to sample those. As well as nighttime sampling. So we can get like the snakes and stuff that only come out during the nighttime or in the dawn. Or like the amphibians that only like to come out during those times. We didn't get to see a lot of the ones that we would expect it to see. Um, lots of lizards or snakes and stuff we would expect it to see on the plots because we never went out at night. Um, that would be really nice. A lot of people like doing night herping, going out to see snakes on the roads and stuff. So that would have been a really interesting aspect to this. I would like to thank my mentor, Mason, for like teaching me all about the whip tails and helping me with all the identifications and I texted him daily and constantly so for taking that and I was not here, he texted me good luck so. <laughs> um, my, Brittany White helped me. She was a girl from UNM. She helped me take some of the measurements at the beginning and it was really helpful. The SEV, and the SEV, my college, for letting me go to college. <laughs> um, uh, fish, you guys are best in fish. You guys helped all the time. You guys, John helped me. I like talked to him a lot. And then UNM for supplying this. Amherst, of course, for letting me freak out about this presentation and talk. It was okay. Ben, for doing the same. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions you may have. Yeah. <laughs>